I'm going to go over exercise 35 and what you need to do to complete this assignment. I have the document here that I've created for you to type your answers into. You can use this document or type them into your own Word document. And note that this uh, refers to a section called data for additional computation. So that's where the data is coming from. And I've provided an SPSS and an Excel file that have the have, both have the data typed into it for you to use. So let's start with number one. Do the data in Table 35-2 meet the assumptions for the Pearson Chi-Square test? So let's look at the data in 35-2. Okay, so here we have our data from Table 35-2. And if we look at our data, we have uh, antibiotic use, yes, no. And we have candidaria, yes, and no. So these are our um, total values here. So we have it represented as summary data. And then I also have it represented this way in case you want to use SPSS or another program where you need each individual data point typed out. SPSS and programs like that can't do anything with this information. It doesn't really mean anything to them. So we have to code for them what each of those observations equals. And here's the code. So a 0 equals net, uh, no and a 1 would equal yes for antibiotic and candidaria. So each individual data point is typed out here. But if you're not going to use SPSS, don't worry about that. So I'm going to look at my data and look at my assumptions of chi-square and see if it meets those assumptions. So let's look at our assumptions for chi-square. Uh, these are phrased just a little differently than they are in the book, but they're the same basic assumptions. So here I have assumption that I have nominal level data. I have assumption that my sampling method is random, which means every person in my population would have an equal chance of being included in this data. I have an, an assumption that I have independence of my observations, which means that each person is only being counted one time. I'm not multiple, I'm not doing double counts on people. And this particularly would pertain to like pre-test and post-test type study designs. Those aren't appropriate for chi-square. And another important assumption is that my categories are mutually exclusive. So if I look back at these categories, each person should only fit into one category. You can't both use antibiotics and not use antibiotics at the same time. So there's an assumption that each person would only fit into one of those categories. And then my last assumption is that I have minimum expected frequencies. None of my expected frequencies can be equal to zero and 80% of them should be greater than 5. So this rule of thumb is they should be greater than 5, and if they're not, that kind of flags it for you to look at it a little bit further. Now note that this is talking about the expected frequencies, not the observed frequencies. With chi-square, we're comparing our observed frequencies to what we expected to get if there's no effect. So when we calculate our expected frequencies, none of them should be equal to 0 if they are then there's another, a different test that would be more appropriate than chi-square. So once we calculate our expected frequencies, we can double check that assumption. Number two wants us to compute the chi-square statistic uh, and give the value here. And then the next couple questions have to do with those results. So let's go ahead and do that chi-square test now. We can do that in Excel. In order to do that, we have to tell Excel what the expected values are. We have a function to do chi-square. It's called the chisk.test. If it's not showing up, just go ahead and click in this box and search for it. Type in chi and then click go. And the chisk test, what this does is compares our actual range, which is the data that we observed, to what we expected to see. Now, Excel doesn't calculate this for us, so we would have to hand calculate that expected range. So the way I would do that, I would set up another table with my expected data. And I just copied this over to make it easier on myself. So I'm just going to delete out the values that were in there to begin with. I can leave this formula. I actually already deleted this one. 
but I can leave those formulas because then it will just do the totals for me once I put in my expected information. And with a, there's different ways to do the expected frequencies for chi-square. With a one sample chi-square, I can either just divide my total across my number of categories, or I can base that on population distributions or previous research on the topic. However, with the two sample chi-square, I need to take into account how many rows of data and how many columns of data I have. And this is a two sample chi-square because I have more than one row of data. So this is similar to a two sample or two way ANOVA where I've got multiple conditions at the same time that I'm testing. So for a two sample chi-square, I take into account my number of rows and my number of column data. So I'm going to calculate my expected frequency for each cell by taking the row total and column total. Said that a little bit backwards. Column total times the row total divided by the total sample size. So I'll show you how to do it for this first one. So I'm going to tell Excel that this is going to be equal to the column total. Okay, it's not liking that formula. This is going to be equal to my column total. It should just highlight like that when you click it. Times my row total divided by my total sample size. So that would be my expected frequency for this cell. And I would just do that for each of these. For each of them, I would take the column total times the row total divided by the total sample total. So it just takes a little bit of time. I just have to immediately set this up. And then when I run that CHISC test, it'll give me the p-value for that result for the, to look at the difference between the two. However, it does not give me the chi-square value. I would still have to calculate that separately. So I'm going to go ahead and use an online calculator for this one. I have this online calculator that is really good for two sample chi-square data. And it gives me the option, go back one page and show you, it gives me the option to tell it how many rows and columns of data I have. And then it's going to set up a table for me to type my information into. So go ahead and take a few minutes and type your information into this table. It's really going to help you a lot with the interpretation of your results. So I went ahead and already typed in my information based on the Excel file. Or just look, you could also just look at the table from the book. So I've got my information typed in here. Let me just make sure that matches. It looks good. So what I'm going to do though, just so my results aren't the same as yours, I'm going to go ahead and just change a couple of these values here. So my results won't be exactly the same as yours. And the option here is to display your individual chi-square values. That's the individual value for each of these categories. You can go ahead and leave that. It just makes the table a little more cluttered and I don't need it. So I'm going to go ahead and say no to that and then click compute. And it's going to give me this nice table which has all the information I need to answer any of the questions about chi-square. So I have here my expected frequencies, and if I look at those, I can see that none of those are zero. Each of those have a, a positive number there. And I have here my chi-square statistic. Now remember, my information is going to be a little different because my, I made my numbers slightly different from yours. So let me go back to the homework and see what questions I have. So number two is what is the chi-square value? So I can go back to that calculator, and this is my chi-square value here. So if you use this or any other calculator, go ahead and take a screenshot or somehow um, do, do the sniping tool or snipping tool to go ahead and just take a picture of that and put it right into your document here. And then I'll have all that information. Then you don't need to tell me what the chi-square value is. I'll, I'll see it there. And you can go ahead and just type it also. Number three wants to know if this result is significant at alpha equals 0 0.05. So let me look back at my chi-square results. And my p-value here is 0 0.030. So let me just copy that. 
And I'm going to compare this to my 0 0.05 level of significance. And in this case, 0 0.05 is greater. So I'm going to say that this is statistically significant. So compare your p-value to the significance level. And then tell me if that's a significant result or not. Remember, I need this rationale. Don't just say yes or no. I need to know how you got that decision. Number four, if using SPSS, what's the exact likelihood of obtaining the chi-score value as extreme to what I observed, assuming the null is true? Well, this is my p-value. My p-value tells me the probability of getting a result as extreme as what we observed if there's truly no effect, which is what we're looking for to see if there's an effect or not. So this is going to be my p-value. Number five, using the numbers in the contingency table, calculate the percentage of antibiotic users who tested positive for candiduria. So this is what we were doing for, I believe it was week one assignment. There was quite a bit where you were calculating percentages and frequencies based off of a sample. So we would look back here, and this wants us to tell, to say, the percentage of antibiotic users who tested positive for candiduria. So we want to know of those that used antibiotics, how many of those tested positive for candiduria? Okay, so out of antibiotic users, how many tested positive for candiduria? So sometimes I'm looking out of the whole sample. In this case, I just want to know out of antibiotic users how many had candiduria. So you need to go ahead and calculate that. And if you need a refresher, look back at week one and how we did that and for those problems. Number six, seven, and eight are very similar. So number six wants us to calculate the percentage of non-antibiotic users who tested negative for candiduria. Okay, so of those who did not use antibiotics, how many tested negative for candiduria? Then number seven wants us to say the percentage of veterans with candiduria who had a history of antibiotic use. So I'm looking for those who had candiduria and who used antibiotics. Number eight, using the numbers in the contingency table, calculate the percentage of veterans with candiduria who had no history of antibiotic use. So that's going to be the flip side of the one that was right before it. So of those who had candiduria, how many had no antibiotic use? So this is just uh, calculating some probabilities based on this table. So we're just calculating frequencies and percentages here. So let's go to number nine. Write your interpretation of results as you would in an APA formatted journal. So this is your two to three sentence, what did you do, what did you find here? So you're going to say something um, like a chi-square analysis was performed and found that antibiotic users did or did not have higher rates of candiduria than those who didn't use antibiotics. So something along those lines, just two to three sentences of description of what was done. And then remember to give your shorthand notation for the results. So here's a reference for what that should look like. We have chi-square. And then our degrees of freedom in parentheses is equal to our chi-square value, comma, p is equal to, and then put what it's equal to, or if it's a really long number, you can put it's less than 0 0.05 or, or whatever it's less than. So this is how we'd write that shorthand notation. And you can figure out your degrees of freedom using the degrees of freedom formula, or you can look at the chi-square calculator and it gives you your degrees of freedom here. So the degrees of freedom is one for my result. Number 10, was the sample size adequate to detect differences? So here you need to do some interpretation of if you think the sample size was adequate to see if there was a difference between the group or not. So refer back to whether this was a significant finding and that's gonna help you. We did have some small cell counts here, so this is a relatively small sample but refer back to whether this was a significant finding or not when you're answering this question. So a couple sentences here about what your interpretation of that is. And that is what we need to do for exercise 35.